Good evening and welcome to Early Late Nights, episode 70, right here on Twitch.tv slash Explosion Network. I am your host once again, Kieran Marchant, here to bring you the latest esports and gaming news around the world, around everywhere, pretty much in another galaxy, probably anywhere. We come to you live every, normally every 6.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time every Tuesday and Friday during our regular year um, to give you the latest news on all that good stuff, all that esports stuff. Hope you've had a fantastic December so far. Hope you have a fantastic lead up uh, into the holiday season. It, it's been a hectic time of year for me, which has led to a bit more of a delayed recording schedule. But we are here for the end of year special episode of Early Late Nights. We're doing an hour long episode, the start time of 7 o'clock. That's 7 p.m. 7 p.m. I'm like normally in bed by now, you know? Normally early late nights finishes, I'm going straight to bed, I sleep, I'm ready for work the next day. Not today though, nuh -uh. 7 p.m. start time. I'm going to be talking to you for an hour. We've got some great stories tonight. We're going to be going through um, and looking at uh, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate and see how that's going to be fitting into the esports world. We're going to be talking the uh, recent comments made by Fear, the Dota 2 legend. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, how Blizzard totally bombed one of its own titles in its esports scene. Uh, and then we're going to be doing, finally finishing up with a 2019, 2018 review, kind of looking back at the year. Going to talk about it a little bit, talk about how I felt about esports this year. Uh, as well as uh, Early Late Nights of the Year in review for that as well. And tonight we're going to be doing something a bit special. Throughout the night we're going to be talking about my top 5 favourite esports moments. We're going to be watching each clip. Going to be discussing why I love it, what it's important, why it's important to esports. And uh, why I'm excited for the next year of, of esports stuff. So we'll get into that in just a second with the first clip. But first I wanted to say in Overwatch Contenders news, uh, I wanted to say congratulations to the Australian team, Sydney Drop Bears, for finishing out the regular season of season three of Australian Contenders as 40 and, well, 20 and zero, meaning their overall winning streak currently is 40 and zero for regular season games. That is an incredible feat that no doubt will be not be completed again many people from across the world will be saying well kieran australia's contender scene not that great drop bears has like the cream of the crop and everyone else is yeah well it's true there is you know there is some skill deficits when it comes to australian overwatch contenders but the fact that this team can go through it without dropping a single map is absolutely amazing and we're going to be seeing a lot more next year with the up and coming playoffs for the contender seasons um, to see whether or not drop bears can continue that momentum against some of the harder teams across the world but hey it might take a second but we'll build to it so as i said earlier in the show we're going to go over the best moments of 2018 i keep wanting to say 2019 and i don't know why um this first moment is a moment that for me embodies what i love about esports uh how characters can evolve how um people can state their claim in the esports world for instantly becoming a crowd favorite instantly becoming the person that people look up to um i've tried to be really non-biased there's only two clips from it um, this is from the Overwatch League this year. Uh, this is from a star DPS player that we got to know earlier in the year in the opening of the league. Big Boss Pine. This is a bit clip of how he earned that name of Big Boss Pine and how he managed to flashbang his way into our hearts. So we're going to watch the clip and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So enjoy. They flip it, get the control percent, rolling early, Jonak does go down, a res comes in from NYXL, and here comes Pine, gets one, gets two, looking for a bit more, gets another one, are you kidding me, this guy is gonna single-handedly change the point back over He's to gonna NYXL, kill everybody. oh, <laughs> okay, Pine, big boss Pine is on the scene, wow, that started so well for Houston too, they forced the early res onto Jonak, Pine, now New York, only a couple percent away. Can they hold it? Houston needs to make this fight happen right now. They need to grind it out, and they're getting the kills to do just that. Pine a little bit on his own here. Oh, but he takes Clockwork out as he comes in. There's another one of Linkser. Here's the hard carry. Gets Fanny with the dead eye, and there's another one. Pine, this guy is unstoppable. Pine NYXL takes well. So a Pine did. 
And just like that, the crowd instantly got a new fan favorite with the New York New York Excelsior coming in and becoming a dominant force within the Overwatch League. It wasn't surprising to see one of their DPS players making such an incredible mark on fans quite so early. The uh, Houston Outlaws were very unlucky. Well, not unlucky, but the fact that they were on the end of that, you do not wish that upon anybody. But Pine displayed a flashiness of showmanship throughout the rest of his play in the Overwatch League this year. His performance on roles such as the McCree or his Widow with his daring flanks and his maybe not too safe and a bit risky plays made Pine a very quick fan favorite. It was a shame that he had to miss out a large part of the season due to um, suffering some, some personal mental health issues, but what we did get to see was an instant classic and an instant appreciation. Esports has the opportunity, much like normal conventional sports, to introduce people to these personalities, these players, these flashy superstars that can really draw you in and, and make you involved with the teams and involved with the stories. And Pine is a great example of that. I don't think I've ever met somebody who is a supporter of the Overwatch League or an Overwatch team that doesn't have a massive respect for Big Boss Pine. That was our first of five moments from esports this year. These aren't in any particular order, these moments. Uh, I think maybe the last one's probably my favorite, but um, I've just put in what is my favorite of the moments. But let's go ahead and dive into some news, shall we? This, with the recent release of Super Smash Ultimate, Smash Brothers Ultimate, becoming a very widely beloved game by much of the fan base and much of the audience very quickly. Um, it's why it's large roster of every character from, you know, every single Smash Brothers so far, including recent announcements of Joker being involved in the game from Persona 5 with Piranha Plant. I got my code for that. I still haven't entered Piranha Plant. Remind me somebody, enter Piranha Plant into my game. But anyway, carrying on from there, we, we see this development and this really meteoric rise of Smash Brothers Ultimate with players taking a liking to it and its wide variety of characters, its great stages. Some people have already commented that you could buy Smash Brothers just as a music pack rather than the actual game. You can get the music pack with the game coming with it for free with something like a ridiculous amount of songs on it, like 500 or something more of songs um, and music from the different games. And it's fantastic. But the question is... Can Ultimate have a place within the esports scene? For many years now, Super Smash Bros. as a category has been kind of dominated by Melee, the GameCube uh, hit that really kind of progressed the Smash Bros. love permanently, as well as being a very perfect game. Despite this being before the world of updates and balance patches, players have now, you know, kind of come to a point in Melee where they have found what they need to do, they found their niches, they know the character rankings, they, they know the place for their characters to really push out and evolve from and roam through. So, for me, that is... It's interesting that that has come forward. One of the the big, uh, I guess, one of the big features of Super Smash Bros. Melee was Fox's um, role within the roster, being one of the strongest characters in the game. Many esports players and professional players main Fox and his dominance on the scene was almost a bit of a scourge in many ways. Many grand finals were seen coming to either Fox Fox uh, Fox Fox fights. That's some alliteration. Well, not alliteration, because I said the same one. Don't worry. Anyway, come down to Fox Jewels, or coming down to different enemies kind of joining up and, and showing that it's, it's Jeff definitely all about Fox and, and falling to Fox. There has, of course, been many counters developed to Fox, many people, but they've never seemed to stick with Fox coming to prominence each and every time. Um, and we're starting to see a bit of a worry. Now, so Smash Bros. Ultimate is currently in a position of unknown, unknownness to it, really. There's not, you know, we're only in the first couple of weeks of its development, players, unless, you know, those who are really involved have been playing through and unlocked every character, there are players still unlocking every character in the mode, they're still trying to find out what their mains are for this game, finding the tweaks, learning the movements, um, as well as understanding the different range of maps and the different ways that characters are being able to interact with each other in this game. So this means that character rankings have not been formed in a wide universal way. 
you could probably talk to any uh, I was about to say Overwatch professional they would never clue any Smash Brothers professional um, to discuss this power rankings and they probably could tell you a very basic list but that would only be of their opinion and I'm sure each one would have a differential matter of the rankings in total that may be influenced by their mains that may be influenced by their position in the game or a general overall experience of Smash Brothers now Smash Brothers Ultimate is in such an interesting time. It is in it is a brand new esport. It is a clean slate currently. Uh, we can have new faces. We can have old faces. Everybody is at ground zero currently. There is no difference in you know nobody can say they've played Ultimate longer by any more than a couple weeks or a couple days even. We've got players who are now have the ability to make their mark on the scene that may not have had that ability in the other esports super smash Brothers scenes because of their established rosters of pro characters and pro players now it's a really interesting time because ultimate could sink or swim it could be very easy for players to drift back to melee to drift back to games that they previously enjoyed or previously fleshed out in but many players are now believing that the GameCube Melee game is kind of done. That players have, well not done, but it's been explored. They've kind of, they've gone across the galaxy and across the world that is Smash Brothers Melee. They have managed to find all there is to find. They've been able to find all the counters, discuss all the tips and tricks of the game. And it's a discovered game now. It's still going to be a very large esport for the next year or two if ultimate does take off melee will still have its role but there is not much to progress there is not many ways that players can really discover new things about the game whereas ultimate presents an opportunity for brand new land to conquer a whole range of characters that may not have been involved in games with each other in the past we now have more characters coming through with more echoes as well as the future of dlc content with different characters we already know the piranha pot plant as well as uh, joker from persona 5 as i mentioned earlier coming into the roster and really shaking it up from my own personal experience i can tell you bayonetta still sucks balls to fight against the Wii U version of the game had a problem with Bayonetta across all of its esports scene, and I'm hoping that issue doesn't continue with Ultimate. Now with Ultimate, there will be more balance patches, I'm sure there will be more changes made by the developers to really shake things up and bring new characters into a new light. But with old characters like Fox and Bayonetta potentially bringing back old habits and old ways into the game, we can only hope that Nintendo has done enough to the game to make it viable and possible for a wide variety of characters. Now, over the last weekend, the launch tournament that took place um, displayed once again that Fox was at the top. Um, with experienced Fox players rising to the team of the crop, um, with two players finishing out, one was a Rob uh, main, while the other one being Fox. And... The fact that, once again, Fox won out isn't a an overall case to say, hey, maybe, maybe Fox is busted. Maybe Fox is absolutely broken. Um, he's really good again. And this could be just saying, this player has had enough experience with Fox, and he has enough abilities now with being able to use the same controllers, being able to bring in the same kind of inputs into the game. Maybe that's just that shining through and these new players or these new characters haven't quite caught the top so we're still waiting for those you know those characters to be fleshed out more for people to dig into the game but what is exciting about ultimate is as i said it is a new land it is a new place for new faces to explore and to come forward through it is probably the most accessible nintendo game with the overall success of the nintendo switch there is going to be more eyes on this game than there ever has been in the past. So there will surely be more pro players that we've never met, never seen before, stepping up to the plate to take part. This game has a fantastic roster, has a fantastic map selection. We get to see a wide array of, of these coming through. So hopefully we'll see more of this coming through. We'll see more of these characters being developed and evolved. And you know, maybe, just maybe, I will get good enough to beat Bayonetta as Kirby. Maybe. It sucked. 
somebody's probably going to be like, hey, Kieran, Kirby's the easiest counter to Bayonetta. I'm going to be like, hey, you suck. She moves really fast. I don't like that. Why are you here? I appreciate you being here, though. Now, let's get on to our second esports moment of the night. Now, if you didn't already know, Dota 2 was one of my passionate um, followings throughout my early, my younger years of getting into esports. I really enjoyed Dota 2, putting 3,000 hours into the game across two accounts. Um, and I was really invested in the esports scene itself, you know, getting up early to get involved in the international. Uh, I had two years of getting the, uh, I think I've got three. Do I have two or three? Do I have three? I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but the physical agencies you got after spending enough money to get the level 1000 um, compendium, I did that several times. Um, I love Dota 2, and of course Dota 2 would still find a place in my heart this year, despite me falling out of love with it and falling out of the game completely. A team that was near to my heart, OG, had a very interesting year across the board, with founding members of the team fly... Um, a founding member of the team, Fly, leaving the team to go and be a part of the new Evil Genius rosters, leaving some bad blood between him and the other founder, Big Daddy No-Tail. It, it was a hard point to swallow. The, the changes happened on the eve of roster lock for the International 8 period, and OG almost didn't have a roster to compete in the season. But then OG stormed onto the scene in TI-8. And boy, oh boy, were there some amazing showdowns. The showdown with Fly's team, Evil Geniuses, was one of the most heartbreaking showdowns I've ever seen in esports. It was like brothers fighting each other, and you could see in the walk-ins how hurt Notel was at the situation. Now, for OG to fight through and make their way into the International 8 final, going up against the Chinese powerhouse that is LGD, I don't think many people had any hope for them, but... Just meant the moments like this could happen. For me, seeing those players win in that moment and, and come together after Anna, the carry player, Australian prodigy, came back from a period of leave to go on and study. Uh, Topson to join the team after only previously playing on LAN once before. His winnings and earnings up until then, as they said in the video, was $3,000. That's all he'd earn until that moment when he earned about three million dollars. That's pretty crazy and pretty special. And to see that team fight through and it was in those moments the International 8 really creates something special. Really creates a, a moment for us to enjoy and to love. I was 
very, very proud of the boys for playing that game and very proud of them for fighting through. Many people thought LGD was showing to win and many po people wrote OG off. It's the state of esports though. You never really know what's going to happen. You never really can tell how a game might play out. Sometimes it's down to teams and players. Sometimes it's down to a bit of luck. But as esports fans, we get to enjoy each and every moment. Have our hearts ring out when teams win. Feel down when they lose because it sucks. Get a bit salty when the game isn't doing what you thought it would do. Even yell at your computer every now and then. It happens, but we love esports and we love these games for a reason. Let's keep going, shall we? Let's go on to our next topic. Um, and it carries on a bit from that with Dota 2. Dota 2 has been a game now for a decade. Well, it's Dota in itself has been around for a decade. Many people have been playing it since the earlier iterations within Warcraft 3. Um, and many people have found themselves within that game and made careers out of that game. Unlike many esports that come and go, Dota 2 has always, always stayed around and always had a place within the esports scene. One of the members of the D Dota 2 scene and one person that's been around since its birth is Fear. Clinton Loomis... A fantastic and legendary player within the Dota 2 scene. Fear has been around since the very early days of Dota 1. He's played in the original International. As well as taking part in various tournaments under different organizations. At TI4, he won the International in the Grand Final. Uh, completing his journey and really fulfilling his legacy. That is his play throughout Dota 2. He, can, he transitioned from being an A tier one carry player to being a top level support player his experience and understanding of the game is absolutely legendary we've really come to respect fear and understand his place within dota within the esports scene he's of absolute legend now in esports many people are told that esports players start to deteriorate after 25 26 most people retire around that time or retire before they hit their late 30s. And it's a very it's a very small lifespan for a career. Most people around the world have now come to understand that many esports players up until now have burnt bright like stars, but flashed out of existence extremely quickly within the lifespans of the games. Games come and go, they begin, and before you know it, before players really establish themselves, they kind of peter out and don't get any further progression within the, within the scene. Dota 2 hasn't been like that, and Dota 2 is one of the games that has really solidified its position within esports. Being able to change up its meta, being able to balance the game and change the game in various ways, Valve is in a fantastic way at cultivating an excellent esports scene, to the point where we have players within the scene reaching their later 20s into their early 30s, where people are now trying to suggest that maybe, maybe it's time for them to hang up their boots, hang up their mouse pads. It's probably a better term. Hang up their mouse pads. We've now been suggesting that. We've now had that. Now, Fear, Fear is an interesting character. Not just because of his legacy as a player, but his legacy helping those out within the game. Many people can kind of put the careers of, say, Arteezy and Sumail, who are younger players that looks up to Fear, um, really show that he has a place in this scene, whether that's bringing up new talent and cultivating them, or as a player himself. Many people, if they have the knack for it and the understanding for the game, can transition from being a player to being a coach. We have seen that quite a bit in the current esports world, with players transitioning into coaching roles, into advisor roles, or assistant coaches. But Fear has always prided himself on being able to be a player. Now Fear, entering his 30s, has come to a point where people have started to tell him, hey, maybe maybe it's time you shouldn't hang up the mouse pad, or the mouse, or the keyboard. Maybe it is time that you pack it in. Now, in conventional sports, the age of professional players is going up. 
we get players like the NFL star Tom Brady entering a, his later 30s and early 40s still at the top of his prime. We get UFC fighters fighting on way past their 30s into their 40s and still being able to fight good fights. The age of these people is getting larger. Professional wrestlers, yes, some people may say this isn't a sport, but it is just as athletic and as just as taxing for people. It is now said that most professional wrestlers aren't in their prime till their early 30s. So, if that's the case, why is it different to esports? Most people will come at you and say, well, reflexes start to die. You start to lose out on those kind of twitches, those reflexes, those understanding. But if somebody were to continue to adapt and continue to progress themselves as an esport player, surely they can continue to grow and to continue to cultivate their ability to play the game. Surely we can find ways for players to change or adapt their method of training. Wax on, wax off in the famous movie Kung Fu, no, Karate Kid. I was, I was going to bait you out with nah, that, not even happening. We get that now, but why, why can't we look? Fear has said in his tweets recently that he has tested himself against younger players, Sumail, in reaction tests, and he's able to keep up with them. He's able to, to match their reactions, so that shows that not all players' reactions are going to deteriorate. If we can find a way of cultivating talent and helping professional esports players play... <laughs> um, God damn it. Co Tranquilo in chat just brought up the crappy Karate Kid remake. Threw me off because I just thought of Jackie Chan. Poor Jackie Chan. He deserves so much better. But... If we can find a way of cultivating people and cultivating the players in a way that sustains their lifestyle and sustains esports, we're going to be in for a much better scene and we're going to be able to have a better connection with players that have been around for longer. This is fantastic and it's a good way to first continue to grow that experience within the scene, but secondly, have more and more players feeding through, getting experience of playing with these stars learning from them and continuing to move forward in a play style. Now, you could say to me, but Kieran, you don't want them hanging around for too long. You, you want them? That's the case. But when you have a player of fierce caliber wanting to stick around, you should do everything you can to help him stick around. He deserves a place on top level Dota 2 teams. He's keeping up. His experience can outmatch much of a younger player's reflexes. Yes, a re younger player can react to something quicker, but if you understand what that younger player is going to be doing, you can plan for that moment and change your play style to counteract that choice. There's a place for experience within the gaming. There's a place for age and late 30s. And the age of gamers is growing older in general as it is. So esports, I hope you find a way, and I hope we find a way to cultivate people with the new way esports teams are taking on the health and lifestyle of their teams. They're taking on these, you know, nutritionists. They're taking on these healthy living experts. They're making sure that their players are active and exercising. That's not just because they have an obligation to do so. That's to give the players the best opportunity to fulfill their dreams with their career. Which is a fantastic insight. Hopefully, Fear gets to continue in his Dota 2 career. And we see this trend happen and change. I'm pretty excited for it, if I'm not going to lie. Esports is an incredible industry. We're growing. We're new. We're, we're just a baby. We're a baby in the life of the world. And these moments are defined by people. These moments are defined by members of the public going forward and members of the esports scene coming together to display something that those general public members don't understand or don't realize about esports. There was a moment at the Video Game Awards 2018 that encapsulated this. I spoke about it at length last week about Sonic Fox's speech, about his characteristics and his personality having a massive impact on esports. And that's why it's one of my favorite moments. It might not have any gameplay. It might not have much to do with the game at all, really. 
But it's a moment of hope. It's a moment of joy. And it's a great moment for esports in general. And that's why it's made my list. Okay. And the game award goes to Sonic Fox, everybody. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> I really want this shit. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, look, mom. <laughs> uh, I guess I want to say this is a big honor. Uh, I kind of just really, really enjoy playing video games competitively. Um, I've never really, really done it for the fame. I kind of just enjoy the rush of like beating people up, you know? Like, <laughs> I don't know, like, even, like, uh, I'm sure you guys heard the story of uh, when I won the IPS finale. The other thing I don't do this for is for the money. It's because when uh, my best friend, one of my, my best friend, one of my closest friends, oh, my God, I'm nervous. Uh, his dad had cancer, and after I won, well, before I even, like, uh, did the match, I told him whether I win or lose, I'm going to be donating at least, like, 10K of the prize winning to his father for his stage 3 cancer. I hope it works out for him. Um, and he really, really. <laughs> I'm so nervous. <laughs> I've never been this nervous. This is more scary than I want Evo. Um, but I mean, I guess I, <laughs> I never really, I had always just done it just to make new friends and bonds in the community. So um, I guess for now, I want to give a shout out to obviously the team that's helped me do all, all the way Echo Fox. I want to give a shout out to. Uh, um, all my friends back at home, my best friend, the Kill Sage, uh, he's helped me out so much through life. Um, we got in black, the, gang, the goons back at home, gang, gang. Um, <laughs> um, uh, as you guys also may know or may not know, um, I'm also super gay, so I mean, uh, I want to give a shout out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I want to give a super shout out to all my LGBTQ plus friends that have always helped me through life. Um, obviously, I'm a furry, so shout out to the furries. Have you any furries in the here? Yeah. Um, guess all I gotta really say is that I'm gay, black, a furry, pretty much everything a Republican hates, and the best esports player of the whole year, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Now, Sonic Fox displays this down-to-earth and humble nature that isn't a character. It's not somebody who's trying to put something on. You can tell it's just him. I don't think anybody could go out of the way to, to be that nervous and that, that just honest and raw as a, char as a human being, as a character, Blech. as a human being. So it's fantastic that we have a representative like Dominic for the scene. It's fantastic that we have somebody like him to push through and to close the gap between the general gaming public and esports, or the general public and esports in general, and gaming. I was excited to see him win that award, and it was a great moment, and I'm really glad that it made its way onto my moments. Let's keep going. Now, I spoke in my discussion about Fear's career, about not every esports has the longest lifespan. Not every game has the, you know, is not going to be the next Dota 2. Not every game is going to be the next League of Legends or Overwatch. And not every producer or company, if they have produced one game already that is fantastic or that is succeeding as an esport, doesn't mean that that success is going to pass on to its next game. Heroes of the Storm was a project that Blizzard got into to find its way into the market of MOBAs. Heroes of the Storm differed from League of Legends and Dota 2, which were already the juggernauts of the genre, by including a gameplay system that 
had a shared XP system for the characters, had skill trees, and the overall gameplay of the game wasn't quite as sophisticated as Dota 2 or League, I guess, if you want my unbiased opinion on it. It considered and revolved more about quests and had elements of World of Warcraft of fighting mobs and fighting bosses. And we had that come through and we had that push forward. And HOTS had some success. People did jump onto it. It was a free-to-play game. People did go over to it. It did contain those characters that people love from World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Diablo. It got more and more in StarCraft even. And it developed. And it, it was a game that other games hadn't succeeded yet for Blizzard. And combined all their IPs together and formed a great IP. It didn't quite hit the mark, though, when it comes to esports. I never heard much discussion about the he Heroes of the Storm. I don't think I've ever spoken about Heroes of the Storm regularly on this show, maybe once or twice. I don't believe that I would have done an esports for dummies on Heroes of the Storm. Because of its position within the gaming world. Simple as that. I don't think I would have put much time or effort. I've played Heroes of the Storm a couple of times. And you might say, Kieran, that is your bias. That is your opinion of Heroes of the Storm coming back and biting you in the ass. Yep, possibly. Good chance it is. Very good chance it is. But the truth of the matter is I don't think Blizzard supported this game the same way it supports Hearthstone, the same way it supports overwatch as its major deal or the same way it supports starcraft starcraft has been a juggernaut of esports for the dawn of time of esports pretty much yes it's not in the current position that it used to be in but starcraft's kind of where it all started for many places like south korea and many fans of the sports blizzard announced in a recent blog post that they're going to be backing off on their support of the heroes of the storm scene for esports they're going to be pulling support for that esports scene um and this coincided with the closure and cease of the heroes of the storm championship um which is going to play out for 2019 as it still has committed to fulfilling 2019 and its role within the gaming world but after that there'll be no more support from blizzard of the esports scene many people are crying out many people are saying blizzard how dare you abandon this game how dare you? Players from around the world are currently losing, losing their livelihood with this game. Players have made professional careers from, careers, careers from playing Heroes of the Storm. That's going to be taken away. That's going to stop happening. Less organizations are going to be willing to put teams into Heroes of the Storm because it's a dying game for them now. There's going to be less prizes, there's going to be less prize money, there's going to be less interaction. Players are going to have to make the choice of do they continue playing Heroes of the Storm, or do they start looking for their next venture in video games? Are they going to try their luck at League of Legends? Are they going to try their luck at Dota 2? It's a hard task and a hard position. It's not just players, it's broadcasters, it's coaches, it's assistant and support staff, it is the casters themselves and the on-screen on analysts. There's a lot of people involved with an esports scene, and to see it come crashing down is not the greatest. It's it's not. It really isn't good. But when it comes to it, I think Blizzard is shifting their point of view. Yes, Blizzard could have done this better. They could have announced this so much better. Instead of just a blog post on Twitter, they could have put some love and care and appreciation for their fans into announcing this game and that for me i feel once again this is activision coming through when it comes to blizzard and i don't want to be a blizzard defender but i am a blizzard defender i'm like bit defender but for blizzard you've probably had an ad at some point it's fine but blizzard as a company doesn't seem like the type to turn its tail and run in. and i still think it's it's a positive that they're willing to they're committed to supporting the game for 2019 and the championship but if you look at Blizzard's current stance when it comes to esports, they are shifting the way they do esports. They're shifting the way they look at the scenes. 
We've already had Hearthstone changing its system from the championship tour that we've come to enjoy and love to this new tiered system that will give more players the opportunity to play in professional tournaments, but also at the top end only invite the highest level of players and players that earn their way through the system to show the best quality content for Hearthstone. Overwatch. Overwatch League is this juggernaut in esports. Overwatch has made such an impact on the esports scene with the Overwatch League this year that it has flow-on effects for these other games. For me, when Blizzard look at Heroes of the Storm, they don't see a, a game that is marketable or a game or a scene that is marketable. Obviously, its adoption rate is lessening since its release. Less people have been playing and enjoying the game. It's a sad time. We don't want to see games coming through. But I think if you'd read the writing on the wall, if you'd seen at BlizzCon the lack of content for Heroes of the Storm, if you'd seen the changes that they'd made to Hearthstone, the cancellation of the championship, it's an understandable point for Overwatch League, over for Blizzard to be in. If you have Overwatch League, which is this juggernaut that you're about to invest more time and more money in doing different events such as going across the country for different stadiums, potentially going across the world for different matches, it's a really interesting and weird time to be formed. But that's where Blizzard's at right now in its life. And that's where Heroes of the Storm is at. Yes, it's not a dead game. The game will still be playable. You'll still be able to get into it. But... It is a showing of the sign of the time that Heroes of the Storm is not going to be around forever. Esports in general, each game is not going to be around forever. It's not not every esports can be League of Legends, Dota 2, Super Smash Brothers, Melee. It just can't. But what we do have is a future, and there is still hope for the scene. There's still hope and opportunities for the Heroes of the Storm players to move on, and it sucks. Kieran, you can, I can get some hate mail for this. The players, they do deserve better. They do deserve more support. But there's still a chance. There's still opportunity. It's just up to them. Blizzard can't hand it to them anymore. It's a sucky but truthful truth. Now... Moment number four. This was recently voted the fourth, the number one top esports moment of the video game awards this year. And I've got to say, it's pretty fucking awesome. In a grand final that had seen Cloud9 destroy its competition in an amazing rise to power, they faced up against fan favorite and juggernaut that is FaZe. In the very last game of the grand final. It was 15 to 14. The game was pretty much phases. They had already wiped out half of Cloud9. Cloud9 had left Stewie2k alone on site B. And FaZe were heading there with three members, including the bomb. 99 out of 100 times? No, 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 no. 9,999 times out of 10,000. No! Whatever is like one less than a million. One less than a million. Like 999,999 times. FaZe would have won this point. But. It was not the case. Not off my slow has been taken out towards the B site. But Alt Automatic's going towards A, nothing else is going on. He's got to go back, Stewie's on his own. But look at the time, look at the time, there's seven seconds to blow the bomb. They're trying to build pyramids, but there's no more play. Stewie's oh! won the round, we go to overtime. Cloud9 have done it! How have they done that? They came back all the way. All the way. And just like that, Cloud9 etches their name into esports history. Just like that, they they managed to pull off this upset, go into overtime, go into triple overtime with FaZe, and win the grand final. 
No other team has done it before, and Cloud9 have shown why they deserve to be in the game. To be in the scene. It it was fantastic. Shui 2K has found himself a place in history straight up. That's insane. Those three shots were all millimeter perfect. In all those other games, FaZe would have won right there. But not that one. It was... Esports is pretty fucking cool. Esports is amazing. That leads me to the last full story for the year. 2019. Well, full year of 2018. I'm getting my years mixed up. I'm prepared for 2019 already. 2018. 2018 has been an amazing year for esports. It really has. And Australian esports as a whole has grown and flourished because of it. And because of the support that esports is now getting. There is more esports happening than ever before. There's more opportunities for players to find themselves in the higher tiers of esports than ever before. Esports is fantastic. In Australia, we had IEM in Sydney in early May. We then moved on and we had the Australian Esports event, exhibition, Australian Esports Open, where we had the Overwatch Contenders Season 2. We've already announced that IEM is coming back for 2019. We've had the Dota 2 Pro League with teams like OG and Mineski venturing across the waters to, become, to come and play in our cities. It's only the beginning. Australia is heavily, heavily held back by its total and lack of infrastructure when it comes to the internet. Our internet fucking sucks. Especially if you're not on the MBN. If you're on the MBN, your internet still sucks. If you are not on the MBN, but you are on ADSL or dial-up still, I am so sorry. I am so, so sorry, and I don't know how you do it. And that stops us from growing, and it stops Australian esports from growing, in general. Fuck. It's pretty, it's pretty insane looking back at it, don't you think, that esports is is such a growing market. And in countries like South Korea, there is such a progression, such an improvement in the way esports is seen, that it, it hasn't flowed onto the rest of the world yet. Universities and colleges around the world are now giving scholarships for esports players. They're now giving more and more opportunities to, to join in on the games and, and to be a part of it. It has been absolutely amazing. The Overwatch League has put a, a staple in the esports world and showed us what it can do. Signing deals with Disney and ESPN, putting on concurrent content week and on week out, week in and out. I don't even, I can't remember what the saying is, people, but each and every week they were putting out content of multiple times a day of for hundreds of thousands of fans. Almost. It's pretty fucking cool. It's pretty exciting. Players in Overwatch League are getting contracts and salaries. We're still not at the point where every player in every esports is getting a decent wage if they reach the pro level, but we're making a difference and we're making a change. Players are getting healthcare, players are getting dental, the players are getting the opportunity to play in the greatest tournaments in the world without having to sacrifice their livelihood. Yes, people are still having to venture to foreign lands and foreign countries to be able to play games. Yes, Australia is still miles away from everybody else, that it's so hard for us to compete for slots. It's so hard for us to, to grow and show what we've got, but there is change happening. This this single-handedly was the best year for esports in general. We're not just having esports players come forward and be prominent in the world. We're getting esports coaches like Jane coming forward and finding a market on Twitch. Finding real-life positions with professional teams. You, if you've watched any esports, you'll know of my love for esports. And you know of my love for Overwatch particularly. I could spend all my life, probably the rest, the next, however long this game is available, I could sit and talk about Overwatch. I could discuss Overwatch. I could watch Overwatch. I could play Overwatch. I could coach somebody. I could watch somebody else play Overwatch and tell them what they're doing and what, how they can improve and ask them questions that will improve themselves. And 
for me personally in esports, I've grown in such a position. I've been given the opportunity to coach, and I'm so fucking grateful that I've been given that opportunity. Because I've found something I really fucking love. I really love coaching. Really enjoy going through and helping somebody. I enjoy people wanting to learn and wanting to get better. If you're in this industry or if you're in coaching in general in anything, if somebody wants to get better and wants to progress, you'll go out of your way to, to make sure it happens for them. Because they're putting in the effort. You can't let them down. It just doesn't happen. And that was a bit of a side topic, but in esports in general, this year has been fantastic. Esports for me has been fantastic. Counter-Strike has reached new levels. League of Legends continues to grow. Rocket League signed a TV deal in Australia. A, a straight-to-broadcast, like a free-to-air TV deal. That's insane. That's crazy. Nowhere does that, you know? Like... Nowhere signs those deals so quickly, like not for esports, and and Rocket League did did it, and Rocket League continues to grow. We're getting more and more opportunities, and that's what's happening in the up and coming year. And that's where early late nights has been. Early late nights started in March this year as a gaming news show where I could talk about my love of games, and I did love games, and I do love games. I fucking love games in general. I can and give you gaming news, and go through gaming news with you, but I realized, and it took some help from Dylan of the Explosion Network, that I'm not as passionate about normal games as I am about esports. There's something about being competitive, that being, being, you know, being able to learn a game, being able to test myself and get better, and tell myself I fucking suck, and I need to put more hours into this game to get better. That I should be able to destroy this person. Or that I know the game inside and out. And I need to be able to apply that knowledge in the game to be better. Early Late Nights has shown that transformation. It started as that shitty fucking show with crappy effects. And and I didn't know how to talk at the start. I, I watched the first episode back recently and... I haven't realized how much this has changed and evolved. With the decision for me to start talking only about esports within this forum, it's given me more of an opportunity to learn and understand the esports world. It's given me an opportunity to, to learn everything. <laughs> I interviewed myself for fuck's sake. Yes, the, the nerdy comic stuff has, has kind of gone away. There's no more of those terribly cringy fucking interviews, like, um, interviews. Terribly cringy, uh, intros. There's no applause anymore. I don't do 60 seconds of trying to get through the news with incredibly loud music that I just didn't turn down for months on end. Because I didn't listen to that part of the show properly, and it was really fucking loud, and if I blew your earbuds or eardrums out, I'm not- I d I apologize, I'm not gonna take it, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not paying for your eardrums to be fixed. Hopefully you've fixed them by now, because it's been, it's been quite a while since I had that music, but esports has been an excellent time, and that's why the thumbnail for this episode is a combination of thumbnails that were from throughout the year. I've really loved doing early late nights, I've really, really enjoyed it, and I, I don't know what's in store for early late nights in 2019. I'm excited to see what's in store for early late nights in 2019. It could be big, it could be little, it could be it could be the same. And that reminds me, if you've enjoyed this hour-long episode, please let me know. It was more of an experiment and a test, and I wanted to see if I could talk for an hour pretty much straight, if I could make that much content properly, um, but Give us feedback. Do you want an hour? Do you want half an hour again? Do you want once a week? Once a week's pretty cool. Or do you want twice a week? Um, three hour long ELN. Fuck no. I need some kind of life. Um, but early late nights has been really fun. It's been really great. So there won't be any more early late nights for 2018. We're going to finish up for the year. I'm not sure when we're coming back in 2019 yet. But keep your eyes and ears posted. On Explosion Network's Twitter at Explosion Pod for the announcement of when I return and when I come back to the studio. 
But you're telling me, Oi, Kieran, you forgot number five. I did not forget uh, eSport moment number five. This is single-handedly my favorite moment of eSports from 2018. I got the year right that time. Go me. I know what year it is still. This clip shows the understanding of the game. It shows the understanding of the psycholog psychology of the game. It shows how coaches can have an amazing influence and impact and strategies can change games completely when it comes to the game. And also it shows how certain moments in time and certain events can cause gears to turn and the balls of time to move to a point where something completely different happens. Hope you enjoy it. It's probably my favorite name for a play or a single moment in esports and... I'll probably talk about it a little more after it. Moved out. This will be a, the, the setup. It'll be the Arisa Roadhog Diva combination with uh, Birdring playing Widowmaker. Profit now on Junkrat. He's just going to charge this Ari up. Especially if they go towards the point, you're going to be able to keep everybody up as well. I look, Silk Thread on the Zaggy here. I feel like more recently, we're not asking what Silk Thread can do anymore. We're all kind of asking what he can't. So many different heroes that he can sort of bring out. Hazard was very effective. Okay, I like this for the Gladiators. This is, this is cute. They're gonna try and circle around. The Spitfire, wanna interrupt this a little bit here? Where are you going? Where are you? Oh, the, the high, ground. high ground. Yeah. Oh, this is so nasty. Shulfo's chilling in spawn. So he's waiting here. We can sort of walk out. What is he trying to do? Uh, I think he's gonna either, he's gonna either switch to Widowmaker. Uh -oh. yep. yeah, he's gonna be the play. He's gonna switch to Widowmaker. I'm gonna call this the merry-go-round because it makes me laugh. Makes me happy and Shulfo switches to the Widowmaker at just the right time. Closer drops down and it's a day in the shooting range for Lane the Canadian superstar unloads on the Spitfire and they get completely smashed. Sometimes, Matt, the best laid plans fail, but not this one. Big flank from the Gladiators and they let loose the Widow at just the right time. And there, there's a lot of things he could have done from that position. If London would have stayed up on the high ground, maybe he comes out on like a hit scan hero or somebody like a McCree or even like a Tracer try and play. Well Yes, it was another Overwatch League clip, and I'm sorry, but I couldn't resist. That play is called the Great Bamboozle. The LA Gladiators used the fact of a common strategy of goats, running it out and around, trying to hide the fact that not every member of their team was playing in the roster or had run out of spawn. They ran it right around, they gave a better angle for their team, where Lane Roberts, also known as Sure for Sudden Spawn, is the character they thought was with the team, switched to Widowmaker and landed some of the best shots and most perfect shots that he needed to in that moment. If you watch the clip, or if you go back to YouTube and look at the clip later, as you witness it, if you look down at the player cams, Shawfort isn't looking at his own screen in the early parts, he's looking at iRemix's screen to see where they are. This single play shows the thought, it shows the, the process of the managers and coaches of the team to come up with this strat. It shows the mechanical kill, skill, mechanical skill that led to kills of Shawfor, of... Because if he didn't land those shots, that, tr that fucking strat wouldn't have worked. If he didn't land those shots, it wouldn't have worked. For casting in esports, Uber shouts casted that moment so well later in the in the match he calls it that the gladiators are playing 4d underwater mahjong he he talks and he's his genuine excitement comes through in that cast and it's hard not to be excited by it it's hard not to love what they did and then it single-handedly set in motion the London Spitfires win of the Overwatch League 2018. Because up till that moment, London Spitfire didn't look that great. London Spitfire did not look like the London Spitfire of Stage 1. But, becoming the laughing stock of the Overwatch League, the team that the Great Bamboozle worked on, fuck. In the next two matches after this one, London Spitfire came out with such fury, pardon the pun, such utter anger in their play that they dominated and they carried that form all the way through to the grand finals where they finished off 
Philadelphia Fusion in straight sets. London Spitfire was rallied up by that moment. That moment caused so much. That moment was so interesting and so perfect. And so many coaches can learn from how the LA Gladiators team looked at that strat and made it their own. Fuck, I love esports. Esports is really cool. Thank you for joining me on twitch.tv slash explosion network. If you did your first show, it's a pretty, pretty fucking good show for you to come in on. Hopefully you've enjoyed the hour-long format. If you want to see more, make sure you give us a follow on this channel uh, and get, put that notification thing on so you get all the notifications for all of our other podcasts and streams that'll come online at, you know, random times throughout the day. Follow us on Twitter at ExplosionPod or over at Facebook at the Explosion Network uh, to get the latest updates on our uh, content. Go to the website, ExplosionNetwork.com. Just ExplosionNetwork.com if you want to see all of our podcasts, our articles. Dylan and Ashley do fantastic work on that website, and Cherie does, and Nick does. They, The Explosion Network does fantastic work. I really enjoy the work the guys put into that website and the articles they come up with. Make sure you stick around for all the 2018 top charts or top 10s uh, that we're doing starting this Sunday with podcasts and articles. Bevan Beats playlists, pretty dope. Pretty fucking dope can do this for the last time for the year this has been early late nights the explosion networks esports gaming news show right here on twitch.tv slash explosion network we normally come to you live every 6 30 p.m australian eastern daylight time every tuesday and friday right here on the channel twitch.tv slash explosion network like i already said but if you can't make it to the show that's completely fine 24 hours later 7 p.m australian eastern daylight time on the wednesday and the saturday the show goes up in full glory as video on demand at youtube.com slash explosion network explosion network.com for the audio version or all good podcasting services Thank you very much for joining me for the last episode of Early Late Nights for 2019. I hope you have a fantastic Christmas. You have a happy new year. I hope you really enjoy every moment of gaming that you play for the rest of the year and on to next year. You get the next rank. You you define the next milestone. Your team wins a tournament. You, you find a new strategy or you learn that you enjoy coaching. If you do enjoy coaching or if you want to try coaching, just go put yourself out there it's fantastic i can promise you that as always don't be toxic and remember at the end of the games always say gg see you later